fiction, the imagination is not real. At least in the sense that you shouldn't act as if it was real in the most literal sense of how you have to react to the things that are real, that have rules to them, that you cannot, they are immutable. So, not least, because fiction, imagination, is authored by someone. Is it us? Is it something else? Is consciousness something else? Are we, who the fuck knows? That's not what this video is about. But my point is, what makes fiction and things that aren't real, something you have to distinguish between, not in a hard sense, is that because they were authored, they didn't necessarily have to happen the way that they're described, the way that their story goes, as it were. So at the start of this video, I'm just going to say this before we get deep. Don't be a nutter. With that said, and I'm not attempting to play semantic games here, I'm actually doing the opposite. I'm trying to describe how I see these words and what they mean to me. I do think fiction can be true. In a Jordan Peterson, Joseph Campbell sense of tapping into some archetypal imaginal meaning that is at a higher resolution than the actions or the words that make up the story. The minutia of it, as it were. What it's trying to represent. On a lower resolution, the actions, the meanings, the higher resolution of what is being transmuted, what is being communicated, perhaps a better way to say it there. In the same sense that the notoriously elusive, all is one sentiment of Buddhism could mean everything or nothing and a million things in between and a million interpretations and varieties of that, depending on what you bring to the table, which is a key component of this. So this video is about an episode of Game of Thrones where there was a scene which the first time I hit it, this is how you know a really important moment where, as I say, it connects outside of the concept of just being a story, an aesthetic journey, something pleasant, something moving. It hits something that's, that's true, even though it's explicitly not real. It's, it's presented as a conceit. It is clearly a fabrication. They're admitting it. You know that's an actor. You know this was a written story. You know these things didn't happen. But in the imaginal, they are true. So in this episode, something hit me. And the first time it hit me, just like every great scene, think of if you've ever seen the movie Gattaca, some of the key scenes in that. It hits me every time, and it might even get more powerful every time, especially because of the following actions and what they might imply within the same story and then the outcomes of that. So this was a real riddle for me when I first saw this particular scene, and I've gone back to it many times over the years. I've tried to solve the riddle because when you're young, you naively think that that's impossible, whereas I now understand that. The premise I see for a riddle is like a Zen coin. Maybe go and look it up. It's less about what the author means by it or the idea there is an answer or that getting to the answer in terms of just getting the answer, is it? It's getting to it in the sense of the experience you have to go through, the lessons you have to learn that could even give you a clue as to what was being suggested. And that experience is the lesson, not the answer at the end. It's why in certain tests, you have to show you're working out. You could technically just fluke the answer, right? A number, there you go. But unless you have the working out, they don't know that you actually understood it, that you actually did the process, which is essentially what you were being tested for, not the ability to write certain numbers on a piece of paper. Anyone could do that in theory, but a bunch of monkeys banging on typewriters technically could eventually just write the right answer, right? So let me explain the scenario I'm referring to here. It's from Game of Thrones, Season 1, Episode 9, the episode called Baylor. Now, there are obviously going to be spoilers now. If you can't figure out what to do at this point in the video with spoilers, then fuck you. So, Ned Stark has at this point in the show, if you've never read the books, been presented as if he's the protagonist, which is something they love to do in Game of Thrones, so they can pull the rug out from under you. And as a protagonist, he's everything you'd want him to be. It's the reason why they cast Sean Bean as this character and why George R. R. Martin made him like a northern man. And if you know anything about northern England, by the way, Westeros is essentially just England slash the United Kingdom. And the story about it, he's even just tied culturally things to that. Even the accents they cleverly cast on the show it was one of the smartest things they did, actually. And so if you don't know, my accent, now it's a little bit polished off, essentially is more like the Onion Knights, if you know where he's from. Interesting comparison you could make there. 
So he's presented as this honourable man, and they even sort of even hint to a fault, right? He's stoic, he's hard, but he's got a softer side and a love of family above all else, seemingly. So he goes to King's Landing in the story, the capital of Westeros. By the way, spoiler, it's just London, basically, if you know, again, the history of the United Kingdom in England. And he gets dragged into this world of political intrigue and espionage. And it's just this dirty game, which is not only not his style, but it's, it, he doesn't have the skill set for it, quite frankly. That's what season one's mainly about, you think, when you start watching it. Even though someone might appear to be on your side, this is one of the lessons he barely is able to learn. Actually, they serve other interests, often unknowable or undiscernible, sometimes maybe even to themselves, depending on the characters. That's something that's hinted at in the books. So he's going there and doing all of this out of duty and honour, to his, duty to his friend and the king, and honour, again, for his friend and for the realm. The idea that, like, this is something important that must be done. Like, someone's got to do it, so why not me? Like, no one else will do it. That's kind of a, a thinking, right? That's essentially what Robert tells him. Like, it has to be you, essentially. So, in doing so, going through this journey, he finds out two details. One is that Cersei Lannister, the wife of the, the king, her children have been born of incest with her brother and are not actually the children of the king. They're obviously the prince and the princesses. Like, he, he thinks the princes, they th so the king thinks they're his heirs, right? The other detail he finds out, along with this, and actually technically first, is he finds out that her husband, the king, does have real heirs, but they're bastards, so they're actually the true uh, next claimants to the throne. Now, when he finds out that the children of Cersei are born of incest, he understands that his friend is so vengeful. Just think about how he's been talking about Rhaegar and all the stuff with Lyanna and stuff. Like, he understands that if the king finds out, the flaw of his friend, the king, is he's incredibly vengeful. So probably he would kill her, probably kill her children. So he just goes and he thinks as an honourable man, I even understand this, this part I sort of agree with. He goes to her and he basically just tells her that, like, you know, just get away, just get out. Like, just don't let him kill you and your, your children. He tries to do for her what he would presumably want someone to do for him, right, in that kind of scenario. But what he underestimates is she herself is a very vengeful person and who knows how to play the game of thrones because she basically grew up in that world. Remember, she's the sort of the daughter of Tywin Lannister. Like, she, she's on some next level shit in terms of being a scumbag. So she essentially even threatens him and sort of just says, hence where the term Game of Thrones comes from, like, you either play the game, you either win the Game of Thrones or you lose or you die or whatever. Like, the, the logic is, like, this is you're playing for life or death here, mate. Well, when you say that to someone... He doesn't take the cue from that. Again, he thinks, right, well, whatever, she's just angry or whatever, and plus, you know, what can she really do? So the key detail is finding out that her husband has real heirs at the moment doesn't matter because he's still alive. But it will obviously be key to who will rule next in Westeros, which is what Ned Stark doesn't seem to fully understand. So, oh, surprise, surprise, all of a sudden, Robert Baratheon, the king of Westeros dies of poisoning, but it's presented that he was killed by like a wild boar or whatever. Now, Ned knows that Joffrey, Cersei's son, is not the rightful heir. And he thinks he's able, through Littlefinger, to secure the power through men, to see through the actions of making sure that Joffrey isn't going to become the king, and that instead... It could be Stannis Baratheon, if he's able to do something about the bastards, maybe it can be one of them. And so, basically... Because he doesn't know how to play the Game of Thrones, and he's a very naive individual, Cersei and Littlefinger actually work together, beat him in the Game of Thrones, he is imprisoned, and this is the scene. When he's, I'll link it there. When he's in prison, Varys, the master of whispers, who claims to be serving the good of the realm, although in the books he has his own separate motivations, which are never really explored in the show, but I will say they're vaguely alluded to by that like weird pivot he takes towards the end of the show to a certain, let's say, inclination. They just can't, they just didn't have time to set up certain storylines that were actually way better than, than in the show. He approaches Ned Stark with this offer that if you essentially give up your honour, just give it up, Say that you, it was all nonsense, all the things you've said about Joffrey not being the true heir, etc. It was all lies, vile lies. Go, she'll let you live. Go to the wall, which is the area at the top where, like, you know, they, they're the watchers on the wall. They watch out for the people because, obviously, there's a whole side plot with the fucking night army, which, obviously, they piss away in the fucking shore. And he might get to live there with his brother, who's already taken the oath of the black, and, obviously, his son, 
his bastard son in this scenario at this point in time. He's also there. So, you know, you'll still get a family there. You'll be alive. Plus, your family here will be safe. And then Ned delivers this epic speech, which I'll just basically read out the part that I'm thinking of. So once Varys has made this uh, offer to him, Ned says, you think my life is something precious to me, that I would trade my honour for a few more years of what? You grew up with actors. You learned their craft and you learned it well. But I grew up with soldiers. I learned how to die a long time ago. Now, what's so powerful about that speech to me is that it actually had this like Proustian effect on me where the thing that makes Proust incredible is he'll just hit a lightning bolt where you're like, what the fuck? I've literally never heard anyone express or say or act out that thought or feeling, but I've had it. And holy shit, there's that instant connection because he put so much attention to attention to attention to attention to attention. He brought so deep into the core of to be human that he, that's essentially what he did. He failed in many ways as a novelist and a writer in other ways. But that one aspect, he almost like broke the matrix in some ways in terms of the imaginal, in terms of what it can represent, in terms of what I'm talking about, the idea of something being true, even though it is not real. It didn't happen. So when when that was said, Someone on the screen was saying what I thought and felt, but rarely, I mean, almost never heard anyone else say or do. I mean, I have in some degree, like A Man for All Seasons, the classic film, and it actually has a similar kind of vibe to it. But when he says this, I will just say one little note before we go deeper here. Don't make the mistake I did of being overly attached to that as if, because it resonates with you, it's actually like all true because if you know anything about what happens that comes to you through a screen through anything commercial quite frankly there is some level of twist going on there's some level of let's use the good part of this to sell a part that's maybe not so what i'll say is this be very wary of the danger of media in this regard this could be its own video i could go full fucking McLuhan on your bitch asses they love white lies which take a truth and wrap it in a lie to make it palatable and thus condition you, because you accept the truth, to also live out the hidden lie in your actions, emulating what you see as wonderful because of the truth on your black mirror or the silver screen. I mean, I would just say, go look up that Lord Tennyson quote, like about how a, a, a lie, which is half truth, is ever the blackest lie and the whole explanation that he gives there. Question everything that is presented to you just by another human being on your screens and through a company, especially even more so, but question everything anyway. It's the only way to live. Now, the level one interpretation of what happened in this scene goes like this. Honor is a set of principles to be lived up to. That's what I thought. It's not just some something you can compromise. You can't trade it away for baubles, for luxuries. In this case, those would be the promise of no more harm to those you love, some degree of freedom, extended life, then obviously it could be cut off right now. Now, my interpretation at the beginning went like this, like Ned Stark. It's better to die an honorable man than to live as a dishonorable man. That's what he means. Trade it all for what? A few more years of, of this, Exactly. He's not even going to get to be himself anymore, is he? He's not even trading away from his original life. That resonated so hard with me because, listen, I am someone who has an inclination towards being idealistic, romantic. And by the way, when I say that, people nearly always say that as if it's like, but I've overcome, like as though they're an alcoholic, like, but I've overcome that and I understand now I've got to be pragmatic and I've got to compromise and I've got to do the things that people want you need to make money. It's like, I don't. I give no apologies. I don't regret any of it. I'm going harder in that route, if anything, the older I get. Now, most would dismiss those notions because it clashes hard with pragmatism, with what allows them as a strategy to succeed in the world. But I actually think most times pragmatism is basically an excuse or a coping mechanism to allow one to simply benefit in the short term from doing something that doesn't feel right to them, doesn't seem true to them. They think to tell a white lie is better than to tell a black truth, as it were. I disagree. But that's an entirely separate video, isn't it? When you consent to the lie, 
it becomes part of you now. You accept it into yourself, you opt into it, and it will further compromise you. Now it gets easier the next time to lie, like a destructive drug addiction. The meaning of life for me is to live well. Now we have to define that. What does it mean to live well? It means to refine ourselves and thus affect those around us, our loved ones, and therefore be capable and receptive to their love in doing so. The, the ultimate power in this world is this. When you love someone truly and you feel their love in return, you can do anything for them. You will do things for them you won't do for yourself. You'll betray yourself. You'll compromise yourself for things in your life. But if it's for them, no one could defeat you. I could do a whole separate video, I probably will, maybe of, a, of a, another example of true fiction, which would be Hector in the Iliad. There's another powerful aspect. That, to me, is the ultimate fuel of the universe. And it's why it is so important. Nobody can do it alone. Nobody can do it without a support network. And that's why. Because this is how we power each other. Despite what he said in that scenario, the show continues, he appears in a later scene at the Sept of Baelor, this central area in Westeros, and he publicly denounces himself and his previous words as being traitorous, declares Joffrey the true king. He thinks doing so, I'm going to speculate, will save his family, like Sansa, who's there and is in the grasp of the Lannisters, obviously that's terrifying as a father, Rob, his young son, sadly in the show, they don't show how young he's actually supposed to be, so it makes his actions seem a lot silly. If you know how old he is in the books, like, it's perfectly fucking reasonable. He's a, it's actually a legendary character. He thinks, I don't want him to go to war, do I? He's just a boy. He's going to get killed by these fuckers like Tywin Lannister, isn't he? Or Stannis Baratheon. He thinks he will still get to, in some way, positively influence the world by going to the wall, or being with his family there, keeping his family safe to some degree. Presumably, he thinks war is worth avoiding. He's a man who lived his life with war, as his speech sort of said. But the problem is, he's betrayed Joffrey. The guy he's literally even helping out has him executed by beheading, because in this, in the short least, he's just a cunt. That's all he is. And so war still happens to some degree later. More of his family end up dead. Terrible things happen to Sansa, his daughter, at least in the show. I mean, terrible things happen to everyone in those books, don't they? Now, here's the interesting thing. Most people would even say he was an honourable man who did a dishonourable thing, but for the right reasons, because they're about pragmatism. Now, that was my level two interpretation, but with a different twist. I thought to myself, this is what for years I thought, right up until today, basically. I thought, even though I wouldn't do it, I get it. What he did was he transcended the notion of honour because he gave up his honour outwardly to protect those he cared about more than him being considered an honourable man. Now, there's even a side element you might not understand that's kind of, it's kind of like in the words of what's said there. And I don't even know if George R.R. Martin meant it, but I think it's truer than anything he meant if he didn't, which is that his wife, Catelyn Stark, was called Catelyn Tully before. And the Tully's family, every house in Game of Thrones has mottos, etc. that's kind of defined the philosophy of their house. Their family motto goes, family, duty, honour. Now, that is the order that actually at Ned Stark seems to now be a following. Family first, then duty, honour, last of the three, but still important. That's over his inclination and his life's path, which was largely about duty and honour. And then family's mixed in there somehow, and he's never quite figured out the hierarchy as much, right? Duty in this case, by the way, would be, see Stannis made king. Honour would be, I won't say a lie. He chooses family over all that he thinks. Now, at the time, and for many years... I thought that was my solution to that. I thought, I can't do that. I won't do that. But maybe that's a failing of me. What a beautiful display of how much love he had. He was willing to be thought a villain and a liar for the rest of his days to protect those he loved. And I didn't get it. And I'll even say at the time, my own situation was different enough that I maybe didn't understand certain interactions that we'll get into in a second. Plus, I will say, it's not entirely out of line with his character. Like, think about earlier in the show where he allowed that wolf to be killed that hadn't done anything wrong. He killed a deserter who actually was entirely trying to help fucking everyone. His family, uh, obviously, have had to go along with certain things from kings they didn't like. Now, I will say, that's also a part that they didn't explore in the show that I thought was a bit fucked up. It's like, wait a minute, dude. Like, think about what happened to your family, though. Like, if your family 
had chosen family over duty and honor, one of them wouldn't have been burned alive, your dad, and then your brother wouldn't have, like, fucking, like, hung or whatever trying to save him. So in that scenario, like, he, to me, maybe because he's the younger one, he, he didn't get the message of that. So remember, his brother was even the man that Ned's current wife was originally betrothed to. So he does, in a way, kind of give betray some of his family what they died for by giving in in this sense. So what's interesting is, as I think about it more and more, it still has a part that seems beautiful, which is the true part, but then it's wrapped in a lie, which makes it a half-truth. It becomes horrific, in my opinion. So today, the 24th of November, 2020, I found a higher resolution of this riddle, which by all means, by the way, may never be resolved. No story ends, meaning seemingly an endless drilling into something greater. Level three goes like this. You end up seemingly back at level one to start, but for other reasons, because it's not simply about honor in terms of how we've been conceiving of honor in this video thus far. <laughs> Because Ned's conception of honor was to his ideals as abstracts and to the realm, to state power as duty, succession concepts, all invented concepts, by the way. Hence, why to him it's so important that, it's that Stannis has the claim. That shows that he's still trapped within the mortal realm, as it were, the everyday, the nuts and bolts of the world. Now, that was worth transcending to him. As I pointed out, I actually do think it has a limitation. And he was right in the motivation to do it for family as the best reason, or simply just the people you love, in this case, the people closest to you. But I think what Ned forgot was this. Only those who are powerful, this is a lesson Machiavelli would teach you, only those who are powerful and strong can be compassionate and merciful. He was in neither state and thus could not even ensure the other end of the bargain was maintained. And so guess what? It wasn't. He died for nothing, and he lost both his life and honor. And even if he hadn't, he'd always have been at the mercy of those people to revoke their part of the bargain. So he actually never was trading for anything of value. It was like in a movie where someone has a gun on the one that you love and they go, drop your gun or I'll shoot her. Well, if you drop your gun, they can just pick your gun up and go and shoot him anyway. Fuck you, have. Which sometimes happens as a way to be like the ultimate evil bad guy, right? Your only chance to, e to ever stop that person was shoot first, or if they kill them, you simply kill them in return. Like, that... To give it up in that scenario was was no example. This isn't like a simple case of where you have no weapon and someone steps out with a knife on the street corner and says, give me your wallet. And you think, right, I'm not totally in the middle of nowhere. If I just give him the wallet, I, can, I might be able to go. In that scenario, that's different. We're talking about one here where you're completely at their mercy and they're not someone you can trust entirely. So this is the interesting thing for me. The reason I actually think it was right to die for honor he just didn't do it because he lost his honor right before he died. It's because in that situation, it's because of what honor actually represents when you move past the lowest resolution understanding of it where he seemed to be trapped. It's actually a duty to what is true to you in life. Now, think about this, purely my own opinions here. What I think makes my family love me it's not simply familiarity. They were just around me a lot or just we had some idle fun together or you know what, they got the same name as me. I would hope it's what I represent and embody as a man. Hence why they could no longer love me if I do certain outrageous things in the world, certain actions towards them, evil things. They could stop loving me. They could break their heart, right? So hopefully it's part of what I represent, what I embody as a man. Thus, to give up what I represent and embody as a man is to betray their love and the foundations of what has forged our bond, our bond, which is the ultimate fuel source in the fucking realm that you inhabit right now as a sovereign human being. To do evil, to defeat evil, is to surrender to evil and ensure it persists. I'll give you a great quote by a man who... Just investigate him. Just investigate him. Some of the things he wrote and said, again... This is some next level shit. He was called Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And what he said was this. The line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. This line shifts. Inside us, it oscillates with the years. And even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, 
one small bridgehead of good is retained. The key here, in my opinion, is to escape and transcend a linear understanding of cause and effect, a key alchemical principle. But as with everything of, of alchemical truth, it's been bastardized and twisted and sold to you in a different way, in a simplistic way and crippled. So it's misunderstood in the modern rationalist material reality tunnel worldview as X causes Y, as though it was like a rule of the universe. Almost never the case. X causes Y and Z and A and B and sometimes a myriad things, more things than you could ever count. And those things cause other things and those things cause other things and those things cause other things. And as a result, you can never know. Every little action you have can be the butterfly effect going on the entire realm that you inhabit. So... One of the reasons I don't like the X causes Y, and you leave it at that, which is what most people do with their thinking, is because it actually also implies, like I said at the beginning, that it had to go that way. That was always the outcome if you did this. So there's no free will or choice. Now, what I do is this. I disconnect my actions from the response in a direct sense. Indirectly, they are connected. If I didn't do what I did, some of the options of what they might have done are much less likely or maybe won't occur. But it's not direct. Me saying something doesn't make the other person have to say that thing back to me. In the same way as I can choose what to say and how to react. So this is a key, key concept to understand here. The ultimate magic or power of this realm that we inhabit is that choice. It is the choice not simply to react mechanistically or to do the obvious thing or the thing you think you are supposed to do or respond at the level of the action. Essentially, this is what the Buddhist ideal of the idea of transforming negative energy or hate into love is. The idea is if you take the hate and you pass it to the next guy, now he passes it to the next guy, now the hate goes all around the world, it, it spreads and, and it goes on. If you take the hate in you, you resolve it, refine it, you take out of it something good, you leave away the dross, you don't pass on the hit to another person. The hit exits the world. The energy dissipates. There's no more oxygen to the fire to keep it roaring and going up instead of throwing another log on there. This is the alchemical great work of transmuting the dross or the gross matter of the soul into the finest gold, the purest. The world can only be truly changed by one human being at a time making the sovereign choice to change something bad into something good. It is much, much, and this is another secret. Think about this for a second. This is food for thought. It is much easier to influence masses, anyone, more than one, two, three other people, by your own example of change than it is to force them in any way or to convince them with beautiful words. If this video speaks to you, by the way, then it does so because it's touching something deep within you that you acknowledge as true. Not because of sophistry or it sounds like I'm right or, oh, you make a good point. Then, me, it's just not a lot about Game of Thrones. It's not, no, it's not about that. So listen, I act where possible. Obviously, I'm not perfect as I see right. And if the other person, the other individual says they will harm me, they will disparage me, they will otherwise do wrong to or by me, that is on them. That is their choice. That is not just a reaction of mine. And they can't hold me hostage in that regard. I do myself and them no favors if I yield to them as a result of them making that claim. They will feel further justified, assured of their path. I've essentially cemented that what they're saying is accurate. I will open myself up to their full darkness because now I've compromised. Now they've got me. In this realm, if we accept and we consent to the lie, it corrupts us and we are entirely at their mercy because we opted into it. Keywords, opted into it. So let's bring it all the way back. What is the purpose of life? To love, be loved, and create our own meaning in and around that. Maybe that is the meaning for you. It's not just to live longer. It's not just to have money or power. It's not just to have others temporarily unharmed for the sake of each of those things in and of themselves. All of those things can and will one day be cut short and end. Some ideas can live on because even when the sands of time have forgotten them and they are twisted out of recognition by lies and manipulation, there will always be 
men who have conquered their hearts who will rediscover these things because they'll reconnect to something higher, something true, even if it isn't real. So to act right, speak right, live right is to save your loved ones from degradation as well. Only through your example can you hope to help them because everyone helps themselves. You can only point them in the direction. And instead of seeing it with words or commanding them or pointing a gun at them, you live it yourself and they see it's possible. And maybe they come along with you. It's like the, the ultimate example I heard of leadership was Bill Russell said, you can't drag your teammates along with you. You've got to put an arm around them and just bring them with you. Bring them with you. Lead by your example. Holding a standard means that if you do have to part ways and they do something, say something, act and live in a way that is just wrong to you, you say, listen, I'm going this way. I'm going to keep going this way. Anytime you want to join me, you're welcome back. So when you're ready to get rid of that and come back to the right way, I will immediately accept you. This is the point. By holding a standard, it means they can still join you. All can be redeemed. That is the message of Return of the Jedi. Again, some Joseph Campbell shit seeping in there. But the point is they have to come to you. You can't follow them into the underworld and do all the countless acts and then hope that's going to save you. How did that work out for my boy Orpheus? No compromise, even in the face of Armageddon. The author of that, Alan Moore, of Rorschach's character in Watchmen, I'm not even sure he agrees with that. I actually think he probably has slightly different perspective on life. I think that was one of the truest things he wrote in that entire book. It's one of the reasons why I'll compare it to, how about this? How about the samurai from Japan? Because the thing I really admire about them as an abstract concept, is this discipline, is this adherence to a chord. But what I don't like about them, what I can't fuck with, and what I wouldn't have been a part of if I'd been there, is they didn't write the chord. They can't alter the chord. They can't refine it. They can't improve it. And so the chord eventually becomes a prison in itself. And that's my main issue. 